Hey guys, Rob here again from Fit Beach Life, the Homestead Edition. Uh, tonight I want to introduce you to my lovely wife Tracy. Hello. She uh, has been a very big part of my life and, and hopefully I've been a big part of hers. Absolutely. Um, we've been at this 35 years. Homesteading in North Carolina is new. If you watched the other videos, you kind of caught on. We homesteaded in West Virginia for a long time. Um, we ran Dexter cattle and turkeys and pigs and chickens and, and crops and orchards. And we moved here to the beach to give all that up. We were gonna live in a nice little beach house and visit the beach quite often and, and do nothing. Go to work and go to the beach. Didn't work out that way. We, uh, no, we ended up trying to plant tomatoes on patios and um, it just, we gave up. We bought six acres here. We've been here, how long? A year and a half. About a year and a half we've been here on the homestead. And the first six months or so was just getting the house set up, getting everything moved in. We had to build a building. Um, and uh, then, then we got started. We started fencing off. We've got currently 100 by 100 fenced in. We're gonna take that up to a 40,000 square foot fenced in area before spring, which will give us room for orchards and a whole lot more crops, the hoop houses, we've got to repair the greenhouse and uh, do a lot of things. But when it comes to homesteading, it, it doesn't end in the winter time. Tracy got some packages in the mail today and we thought that we take a little time this evening to talk about what we got in the mail and what we're gonna do with it and how we're gonna prepare everything for spring. So I'll let Tracy tell you about the first thing that she got in the mail today. Today I got the Dwarf Cavendish uh, banana plants. Uh, banana trees, plants, whatever you want to call them. Um, these are supposedly easily grown in our area and um, produce 90 to 100 bananas each plant per year. They say that they're frost hardy, freeze hardy down to 20 degrees, but we'll probably grow these like we did the orange trees. Yeah. We'll start them out in the spring and in the fall they'll end in the greenhouse and in the summer they can inhabit a great big huge pot on the patio. Um, the orange trees we didn't have much success in West Virginia with even keeping them in the house, yeah. but uh, down here are the first year using the greenhouse in the spring. Um, they produced about 25 of the cutie size oranges and man, I'm telling you, they were... Uh, they were delicious. They were, um, instead of being picked half green in Florida and shipped, we picked them off the tree right at the height of ripeness. Um, so we're gonna start the bananas this year. We'll have the oranges. Tracy also has some things that she started from seed. We started last year that kind of inhibited the greenhouse, uh, became a fixture in the greenhouse all summer. And which is which? I believe this is the lime tree and this is a lemon tree. So we cut a lime for probably a bottle of Corona <laughs> and kept the seeds out of it and she popped them into a pot. Um, each of the seeds did really well. You can see just in the in the growth from probably the last springs when you start them. Yeah. And just over the summer they've grown into pretty firm trees. So we're growing citrus here on the coast of North Carolina. It may not be ideal, but we kind of want to get everything set up again like we had back in West Virginia. Um, we want to have the orchards in, we want to have the crops in. We grow primarily heirloom crops. Um, our tomatoes are always going to be a Rutgers tomato on the slicing tomatoes, um, a double yield cucumber, and a straight eight cucumber, uh, the California Wonder Peppers, the Cayennes. Um, or the homegrown pinto beans. Yeah, the pinto beans. We first grew in West Virginia and we brought a five gallon bucket of that crop with us and we threw some in the ground to see how they would do and here in North Carolina they produced and they, they produced did. incredibly. Um, we'll we'll kind of show you how to grow pinto beans. It's one of the easier crops you can grow. Now we also got another package in the mail today and we haven't really gone through it yet so we thought we'd open it here and go through it this Put evening. Right there. Put it right here. Alrighty. It's addressed to me. That, believe it or not, the banana trees in these boxes are Christmas gifts, even though that's not till next week. So inside the box, really nice packaging. It says a gift for you. Got a ginkgo leaf, a bay leaf, and and, and some other kind of leaf. I don't know what it is. <laughs> and uh, they packed a lot of 
cardboard shavings. So let's see what you got in here. I already know because I bought it as a gift. One cylinder, two cylinders. Um, let's see here. Two packages of bay leaves dried. Organic bay leaves. Organic bay leaves, yes. And it looks like a package of rooting hormone or two. And a booklet. Which says, thank you from Ballerina Garden. Open it. Open it. Yes. Let's see. Which is... Well, not what I thought it would be, so she can go on to the cylinders because it doesn't really explain anything except how to root things. Okay, so let's open package. That's pretty. Hmm, smells like nothing. <laughs> nope, nothing. Uh, she says, mm, okay, I don't know what it is. Bay leaf tree. Those it are bay is leaves. bay laurel. And what I was thinking, we have looked and looked and looked since we've been here for something to plant as hedge. In, in West Virginia, in that climate, you can grow so many different tall hedges, thin hedges, big hedges. And here, because of the heat in the summer, all the hedges are no more than little bushes. So after a lot of research, I found out that laurel which is also an evergreen, even though it's not an evergreen in the sense of a pine, it stays green year round. I found out that laurel can grow, it can grow into a tree 40 to 60 foot tall, or it can be kept as a real nice privet hedge, six feet, three feet, as long as you keep it trimmed. But it turned out laurel was dangerous. It was poisonous, poisonous to the dogs, to the horses, to the cats, to the livestock. And so I did some more research and I found out that bay laurel was not poisonous. And then that's when I found out, and I didn't know, that bay laurel is actually the same bay leaf that you use to cook with. Very good. So not so, only is it hedge, you can cook with it. And these are just simply um, starts that they're not rooted. They're cuttings off. We're going to have to. Yeah, you'll have to cut that. Get tip scissors. Out. But they're just simply cuttings where they, they just, what we do in. We do it with poplar trees and we can do it with about anything. You, you cut your limb off short. It, too much is, is gives it too much to grow. So you want two or three buds on it and you cut it down below that bud. Use a little rooting hormone, stick it in dirt. <clears throat> about 90% of them or more will root and become the plant they started with. The exception you have to worry about, and, and these trees over here are not, but we like a semi-dwarf fruit tree. But if you take a cutting off a semi-dwarf fruit, uh, fruit tree, you'll grow a full-size tree. So if you take a wine sap apple and take a cutting off a semi-dwarf and plant it, you'll end up with a 40-foot apple tree. Right. Because what makes a semi-dwarf is they graft it onto a different rootstock. Yes. So we've got the uh, bay laurel now. And what we'll do with those is we'll root those. And when they start to grow as bushes, then we'll take cuttings again and cuttings again, cuttings again. We don't have to buy them all the time. We just continue to take cuttings and root them and cuttings and root them. And then we end up with hundreds, if not thousands, where we can plant hedge anywhere we want. And as a side product, we can sell bay leaf. I don't know You're right. how much bay leaf you can sell, but <laughs> you know, we're, we're kind of taking the homestead to a direction of, um, we're, gonna, we're gonna start off as a market garden where we sell our crops locally here to neighbors and friends and people that drive up and down the road. And being that we're eight minutes from Holden Beach, it, it's a huge tourist area. Um, <clears throat> the beach is not what you would think it is. No. When we vacationed here all those years, you were at the beach, and you went to the beach stores, and you went to the restaurants, and you saw all that. You don't realize how much farmland lays eight, nine, ten minutes from the beach. Um, there are huge market farms. 
Um, we've got a neighbor that grows over there. He's growing right now. Um, collards are coming in. Um, the Clemens family has the big greenhouses. They're you know, 15 miles inland um, from the beach, but they've got a, a huge setup over there. So we're, we're gonna take our homestead and grow fresh vegetables and fresh food and, and just sell it. The second year, not this year coming, but the year after that, we want to get into a CSA. CSA. And, and that's a consumer supported agriculture and I think Tracy can explain better what we want to do with that. Yeah, what we want to do is uh, grow ample enough vegetables and fruits to be able to sell shares in our farm and supply neighbors and and local citizens uh, parts of our farm you know every week right it's uh we follow a guy in the raleigh area and, and for the life of me i can't remember his he's got a youtube channel i'll try to put a link down below in the comment section but in a year they took a acre in the raleigh durham area right outside of duke university i believe wasn't it yeah and turned two hundred thousand dollars in sales by using a csa model and what they do People invest in that uh, community supported agriculture means people make an investment in that farm not knowing how the crops are going to turn out they make that investment and as the farm produces what's in season you know early in the season you're going to have early season crops you know lots of strawberries and, and your early fruits and, and lettuce um, salad mixes as the season goes on you, it'll start to be peppers and cucumbers and tomatoes and, and you know in the fall it's the squash and, and the Carrots. apples coming off the apple trees so what you do is you you prepare some people prepare a box and they have drop-off points I think the model that he had they actually had a point system so if you bought in they had two levels where it was 20 points or 10 points and they prepackaged like three peppers in a package and that was two points and people actually came to the farm then and spent their points or could buy more points if they needed more right and that's kind of where we want to go here yeah and we're, we're excited our first year of farming in north carolina was uh different very different <laughs> we we found that nasty dreaded fire ant it didn't take me long to realize that gardens and fire ants don't mix i was crawling through um, the potatoes, wasn't it? No, it was green beans. Green beans. Had the green beans up and I was crawling through and, and, and picking weeds out along the bases, just hands and knees because I, I love the dirt. And while I'm picking on the left and putting my hand down on the right, I put my hand right in a fire ant nest. Um, Rob clearly understands what fire ants are now and what kind of menace they are. Tracy's no, no stranger. You can, you can hear, um, there's four of us that live here on the farm and, and constantly you hear somebody like, ah, oh, daggone, man, I got bit. And it burns, it burns for a long time. It does. And lidocaine. Lidocaine. Is, is the best thing you can own. But we've learned, um, at first I would have used a flamethrower, um, <laughs> the worst chemical known to mankind. I gave up on the organic idea and it was just like, whatever I can throw at these things, they die today. Um, but I learned that spinosad, which is one of our favorite uh, insecticides, which is completely organic, it's bacterial, basically it makes the ants so sick they die. And it works on the Colorado potato beetle, it works on very, very resistant. We just drench them and, and we don't ruin the garden with the chemicals. No. We're going to start a, a huge composting farm here. Um, I'm looking for sources now that do tree work in the area that can just dump their trucks. We'll let them dump until we have a million pounds of um, wood chips from that process. We'll mix that with manure from local cattle farmers, from horse farms, pig farms, and we'll just turn that with the tractor constantly. We need a massive amount of organic material. We've got really good soil here. We do. It's sandy, it drains quick. If anything, it drains too quick. Um, you, when you get later in the season, it takes a lot of water to, to grow. But you know, one of the upcoming videos that I'm gonna be doing um, is drilling the well again. And I'll explain in that one, I've already drilled the well once. I used a method with a pipe and water hoses and I got down 26 feet. 26 feet. And that was it, we were done. So now I'm gonna use this auger method um, and hopefully that'll get us down because the water tables aren't, aren't high here. This water, every bit of rain goes in the water table. And if that doesn't work, I've already found, and I haven't told Tracy this, so this will be shocking to her, but I've already found a $1,500 drill rig that's gas powered 
that it will auger down and, and fight through almost anything. So we've got a lot of projects coming up. Um, it's Friday evening here. Um, tomorrow I've got to do some tractor work on the driveway that we fought. <laughs> I mean, we've seen our pickup truck and our Tahoe um, bumper deep in the driveway. Uh, it's just mud like you wouldn't think you'd find at the beach, but it's slick and it's deep. Not and only that, at the beach you sometimes get 9 and 10 inches of rain in a day, and um, so you get a lot of standing water. And, and I'll show you in those videos, the, the driveway's in a bowl. I mean, it literally comes through a bowl and everybody's property drains into it. We've put... Over 300,000 pounds probably of material between, we started with some stone that didn't work and then we went to a clay sand mix and topped that with a, with what they call marl, which is ancient seabed. They use it down here. It's, you can't get through it, they said. This did. Um, we've got a, a reclaim now of some crush and run with dirt mixed in and I'm gonna go spread a little bit. That's actually held up pretty well. It has held up really well. Um, we can go to town now and not look like we're hillbillies from back in the woods. <laughs> It got bad, but we have a lot of projects. We've got to rebuild the greenhouse. We had the hurricane last year, that our first hurricane. <laughs> that that that's a whole other video. The first hurricane we stayed for it was Category One. Um, we spent the first hour thinking that we were surely going to be dead any minute. The dog lost his mind. Yes. Um, but we made it through that, and 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 they say that if you're going to live the salt life, you've got to be able to get through the hurricanes. So when we went to bed, the eye of the storm had passed over. Um, that's another story. I'll, I'll tell that story someday because there's another fire ant story in the middle of being barefooted in standing water down here. <laughs> um, enough that I had to have epinephrine to stop. I got bit a lot. <laughs> yeah. That sucked. But the, her, the, the greenhouse is a 10 by 12 Harper Freight. Um, it's held up to all the winds that we've had. Hurricane proved a bit much. When we went to bed right after the eye of the storm, the greenhouse was perfect. We wrapped ratchet straps around it to make sure the panels didn't fly off. Not much we could do with the roof, but I had put strips and screws in that, and everything looked good. We went to bed. We didn't know that the back of the storm was the worst part of the storm, and the wind blew on the top of the greenhouse so strongly that it actually bent and crushed the metal and neighbors are still finding panels from our greenhouse out when they brush auger do fields they're like oh that's another piece of robin tracy's greenhouse it looked like a wrecking ball actually hit the back of the roof yeah if i get time tomorrow i'll kind of give you a glimpse of that but we're going to rebuild that with a different type of panel and i'll do some framing work that, that makes it a lot stronger um we've got i've got to reset fence post um i, I think that we could call this uh, first year mistake homestead if we really wanted to, because what applies in West Virginia in a heavy clay and, and, and a rock soil that we learn to manipulate and, and grow in. And down here we have a very fertile soil. The, the place we bought the six acres used to be fields where they grew wheat and, and tobacco. And so over the years it was really built up and we were amazed at the dirt we have. Um, but we still have to do a lot of work and, and learn how to grow. Because man, I'm telling you what, when it gets hot down here. It's hot. <laughs> I remember last year, we started, gosh, we had stuff in the ground in February. Mm -hmm. We did. And uh, we're crawling around in the garden in March and April, and the weather's just beautiful. I mean, you're, you're out there in shorts and in a, in a t-shirt, you're sweating. We would take the uh, kicker Bluetooth speaker out there and just, either she was listening to, you know, the contemporary Christian like Casting Crowns, we'd listen to some country, and we're just having a blast. And then somebody turned the heat on around June, and you can't go in the sun here. No. Uh, the temperature is not a lot different than West Virginia, the humidity levels, but the sun down here touches you in a way that a microwave touches a hot dog. It just, <laughs> you're done. And you know, one of the favorite sports we have, <laughs> go to the beach and watch the tourists come in, because you have all new people every week. Yes. And you always see the argument between the young man and the young lady of him going here, put some sunscreen on her going, I don't need it, I tan easy. Right. And you're looking at her and you're like, oh, honey, you don't know. Right. Because she's already red and, and that's pretty much the vacation. But uh, we'll get some beach footage in some of these videos also because we like to go over and just kind of hang out, take the dogs over there. And, of course, Eddie will be in a lot of our videos. Oh, yeah. Eddie is Tracy's rescue dog. Yeah. That 
we thought was more lab and, and going to be another 100 pound dog like we've always had but he's about half that size but he's twice the spirit he's great and beagle so he bays he doesn't bark <laughs> yeah you'll learn to love eddie <laughs> and then somewhere we've got the big dog he's in his bed he's a uh, five pound applehead chihuahua that i did not want anything to do with when we got i didn't want a foo-foo dog but hector has become my best friend so yes. he'll make some of these videos so don't want to bore you with anything else. We've kind of got to get to decorate the Christmas tree this evening, seeing how Christmas is next weekend. Right. Um, but our granddaughter's out of town until um, closer to the first of the year. So we'll kind of hold off and, and do that. And, and I hope she doesn't watch my videos because really things go on sale the day after Christmas. And by having a few extra three or four days, she can get twice as much because we can afford more. Absolutely. So click the subscribe button. Hit the like button. Hit the little bell down there so that you'll be notified when we update. But we're going to try to do more and more. Um, Fit Beach Life. Um, we're a limited liability corporation. Not a big company. We're just two two people living the dream down here and, and trying to learn how to garden while most people are trying to learn to vacation here. Um, we formed the corporation just simply because I also do diet and exercise work. And these days, people sue you for about anything. So having the LLC was a smart thing to do. And in North Carolina, it's not hard to do. But we're going to go decorate the Christmas tree. Try to get some of that done this evening. Maybe clean house a little bit. Relax. It's been a while since we've had a weekend alone to ourselves. And that's this weekend. But I think right now, we probably ought to go catch another episode of the Crockers. Yeah, the Crockers are cool. Yeah, Jason has got our attention through and through. I think probably... <laughs> Probably when he <laughs> cooked the beaver, right? <laughs> yeah. I, I was a little shocked. I don't know if you follow the Crockers. If you do a search on YouTube for the Crockers, um, Jason's a real interesting guy. He's uh, building a little off-grid cabin, um, micro house, and he's learning a lot along the way too, but he uh, almost got copperhead bit early on, and then he cooked that too, and he ate that, and somebody hit a beaver he found in the road, and he... <laughs> He cooked that, and you really need to watch the episodes because that's what's got our attention on YouTube right now. Yes. It's the Crockers. Um, seemed like a really great guy, and going at it hard. Um, we'll handle the growing and homestead, and we'll let him handle the micro house and off-grid living. Yeah. Um, he's doing an amazing job, so you, know, you check him out. And uh, if you've got questions along the way about anything we're doing, um, how we're doing the rooting or where we get them. I'll try to, I probably should try to put some links in the bottom so that we can uh, show you where we're getting these things out. I shop a lot of this stuff now on Etsy, which is you know just people like us that are selling what they're working with and they don't have a product line, they have a product and, and I try to buy them and support local people. Um, we'll do some more off-grid stuff here um, we get the well drilled. If I ever get the well drilled, that may be the whole content of this series all along is, oh God, Rob failed at the well again. <laughs> but <laughs> I refuse to buy or, or hire somebody to do something I think I can figure out. You, you just could not drill your own well in West Virginia through that clay. Yeah. And down here, people do it. They've done it. They've done it for 200 years. And I, I'm, I'm going to do this. We're, we're going to have water. Um, I want a dual well system where I have an electric pump for irrigation, and then I'm going to put a solar well pump in that runs on solar panels through the day with battery backup so that if we ever have a grid down situation or problems after hurricanes, then we'll have clean, fresh flowing water. Because yeah. water is one of those things that you cannot do without. Yeah. And down here, gardening and, and growing crops and, and putting in orchards and fruit trees, they're going to suck up a lot of water. When it gets hot in the summer, the water goes away and this ground sucks it up as quick as you can put it down. So there'll be a lot in that series too. Yep. We're going to do the drip irrigation. We're going to do the wobble heads. We're going to plumb it all in. Um, the overhead irrigation in the, in the caterpillar tunnels. And we'll try to add a tunnel a year. Yeah. I don't even know if I've told you that. Um, the farmer's friend. You know, those, those are very affordable, well built. But I'd, I'd like to add about a thousand dollars worth of tunnels a year if we can come up with the money. So, well, one thing y'all need to follow our YouTube channel and help us get a little bit of this money. Right. But I think we'll go decorate the Christmas tree now and, and uh, this video will continue on tomorrow while we do some things. I've got a reset fence post that I put in wrong because North Carolina and West Virginia are two different places. 
and, and I'm learning. I'm, I'm going to start talking to the neighbors a little bit more and learning how they do things, but they need to be deeper, this sand gives. So uh, y'all enjoy your evening. We'll see you tomorrow. All right. See ya.